Hello and welcome to another very entertaining video. Today's video is all about calcium and how the body regulates calcium. Of course, we've been talking about bone and so we've got a picture of a bone up here. And what I'd like to do, I think, is reverse engineer this to help us understand why calcium regulation is so important. So as we look at this bone, actually there's a couple of anatomical stru structures we could identify. The diaphysis or the shaft, of course this is compact bone. On either end we have the epiphysis, made of spongy bone or cancellous bone. Of course we have epiphysis down here as well. And then at the junction between these two areas, of course, we have the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. And prior to full size, this remains hyaline cartilage as it has yet to undergo endochondral ossification. But what we're really interested in today is the fact that the bone itself is a massive reservoir of calcium and phosphate, as we learned in our last video, but today is all about calcium. So what are the players in understanding calcium? Well, in the bone, if we were to take a cross-section through the diaphysis, and we're not looking at detail, we're not looking at the aversion canal system or anything like that, that's not the purpose of this video. But in this cross-section, what might we see? Remember, the bone is hollow, and within the medullary cavity of the bone, we're going to find bone marrow, red bone marrow, as this represents the site of hematopoiesis, right? The formation of red blood cells. Well, let's look at a couple of different places. Let's zoom in maybe right there. Let's zoom in right here, and also maybe out on the outer edge, and see if we can't understand what's going on in the process of remodeling and calcium balance. Well, in this first box, I'm likely to find an osteoclast. The osteoclast is actually multinucleated, three, sometimes four nuclei, because this represents fused monocytes. And if you remember from the immune system that we discussed, monocytes are essentially undifferentiated macrophages. These are phagocytic cells. Well, in this case, the phagocytic cell is responsible for chewing on bone. So as we think about osteoclasts, what do they do? They reabsorb bone. This is done in kind of a two-step process, where the first step is the secretion of acid. This dissolves the hydroxyapatite to liberate minerals, the calcium and the phosphate that are in there. And then the second step would be to release lysosomal enzymes. And this is going to go after the osteoid, the organic matrix, that provides the bone with tensile strength. So if we were just to look at the osteoclast, its job to release acid is freeze the minerals and then the release of lysosomal enzymes to break down the organic component. And I want to make sure we understand this is happening all the time. The bone is a very, very living structure. If I was to start a new exercise, for example, and started putting new stresses on different parts of my bone based on the muscle movements that I have, the bone would undergo this massive restructuring and remodeling over a period of days, weeks, and even months to fortify those areas where stress is being applied to it. And so the bone is a constant story of breakdown and rebuild and breakdown and rebuild. And the osteoclast is all about breaking down. All right, let's look at the second box. We're kind of right in the middle of the bone. So what we would expect to see here, a lacuna, and we introduced these previously as essentially a, a dwelling cavity for a cell. And what am I gonna find inside that cell? Or inside that cavity? A cell called an osteocyte. The cavity itself, again, is called a lacuna, or lacunae for plural. And the osteocyte, like its brother, the osteoblast, is all about bone formation. The osteocyte in particular, because it's kind of right in the middle here, is all about bone maintenance. But this is the cell that's laying down osteoid and hydroxyapatite to maintain the integrity of the bone. And then this last box, this outside box, on the outer layer, this is where we find the osteoblast. And again, we can appreciate the idea of appositional growth, where these cells are creating bone matrix. Same thing, osteoid, hydroxyapatite, but they're doing it in the outer layers, adding layer upon layer, and this is what we would call appositional growth. Now, in calcium regulation, why are we starting here? Well, because these are the players that we need to balance in order to balance blood calcium levels. The osteoclast liberates calcium into the blood, but both the osteoblast and the osteocyte would take calcium out of the blood and store it in the bone. And it's this delicate balance between these two cell types, 
the osteoclast versus the osteoblast, that provide the homeostatic feedback loop for calcium regulation. So as we think about these cell types, what we're arguing is the blood calcium levels really come down to a competition between the osteoblast and the osteoclast. So now let's get into the homeostatic feedback mechanism. And to do that, we have to start with an organ in the throat. So to orient ourselves, we see the larynx, and right beneath the larynx, we see this organ, the thyroid gland. Now we'll come back to the purpose of the thyroid gland in just a second, but to start with, what we're most interested in are the two pair glands on the dorsal side of this. So if we, if we look around on the back side of this gland, we're going to find two pair glands, one and two. And these are the parathyroid glands. If we zoom in and look at the surface of these glands, we're going to find a receptor. It's actually a G-protein coupled receptor, so seven pass transmembrane receptor called CASR, which simply stands for calcium sensing receptor. In other words, it's designed to bind extracellular calcium, and extracellular calcium triggers this receptor, it turns it on. But interestingly, without going through a lot of detail, if calcium is bound to this receptor, the end game is to block or inhibit exocytosis. Exocytosis of what? Well, exocytosis of a hormone called PTH, which stands for parathyroid hormone. So if we understand this feedback loop, let's think for a second about what would happen if there wasn't any calcium. In the case of low blood calcium, we eliminate the calcium signal there, which means what? We lose this inhibition, and that leads to exocytosis of parathyroid hormone. So if we were to sum this up, low calcium in the blood leads to an increase in the release of PTH. So we can appreciate now that the goal of PTH is to increase blood calcium, and it's going to do it in two different ways. PTH targets two different organs. First of all, it goes to the bone. Now remember, we've already stated what's going on in the bone is a competition between two cell types. The osteoblast, which is all about building and in the process using blood calcium, which I don't want to do, and the osteoclast, which is all about cutting down bone, which is what I do want to do to liberate the mineral in the bone matrix. However, in an interesting twist, and according to the adage of too many cooks in the kitchen, it's only the osteoblast that has a receptor for PTH. This is important because I, I want to make sure that the signal is clear. I don't want these cells antagonizing each other. I want them to be working together to solve the problem of low blood calcium. And so the cell in charge is the osteoblast. And in response to PTH, the osteoblast is going to do two things. It's going to send a stimulatory to the osteoclast. In other words, it's going to turn the osteoclast on. But it will also send a signal to itself. And the signal it sends to itself is an off signal. And so the effect of PTH in bone is to signal the osteoblast to turn the osteoclast on. With the osteoclast on, the osteoclast will start, will start dissolving bone matrix and releasing calcium into the blood. But so that I don't pick up that calcium and turn it back into a bone, the osteoblast turns itself off. All right, the other target for PTH is the kidney. And under the influence of, a, of PTH, the kidney has the important role of converting vitamin D3 into its active form called calcitriol. Now, just a brief review of vitamin D synthesis, if you recall from our skin unit, it was sunshine acting on the skin that converted a cholesterol derivative to vitamin D3. That's an oversimplification, but that's the idea, right? The vitamin D3 then is in the blood, but mostly in an inactive state. It has a longer half-life, but now under the influence of PTH, the kidney's going to take that vitamin D3 and turn it into a much shorter-lived but very active form called calcitriol. And calcitriol has two different targets. Its first target is the kidney itself where under the influence of calcitriol, we're going to increase the reabsorption of calcium. In other words, I want to make sure that I'm 
reclaiming the calcium in my body rather than letting it go into the urinary system and out to the toilet. The calcitriol is also going to target the gut, where I can increase the absorption of dietary calcium. So if we take a step back and look at the big picture, the release of parathyroid hormone has the overall purpose of increasing blood calcium, and it does it in two different ways. It signals the bone, which under its influence turns on osteoclasts and turns off osteoblasts. With increased osteoclast activity, we're breaking down bone matrix and releasing calcium into the blood. Secondly, it signals the kidney. PTH on the kidney causes the kidney to convert vitamin D3 into active vitamin D called calcitriol, and calcitriol has two different effects. To increase absorption of dietary calcium in the gut from the food that we're eating, and also to increase reabsorption of calcium already in the body so that we don't lose it to the urinary system. All right, to complete the story, let's go back and look now at the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is essentially the antagonist to everything we just said. So whereas PTH was released from the parathyroid in response to low calcium levels, the thyroid is going to respond to high calcium levels. So with increased blood calcium, what do we see? We see the thyroid releasing a hormone called calcitonin. And calcitonin simply has two jobs, to inhibit the activity of calcitriol and to block osteoclast activity. So if my blood calcium levels are high, then calcitriol is essentially turned off, which means I'm not absorbing any calcium or reabsorbing calcium in the kidney, and my osteoclasts are no longer cutting up bone to release calcium into the blood. 